Lilith. Hi everyone and thank you very much for having me. I think this is the coolest stage I've ever been on. Uh, we, I just came back actually last week from our uh, company retreat in Sri Lanka and this really gets me back into the vibe so that's pretty cool I must say. Cool, um, so I'll tell a bit about uh, user analytics uh, today. Um, what I mean with that, uh, I'll tell in a bit first a few words about myself. My name is Marco and I originally started at uh, Rocket Internet, then became a freelancer and uh, then decided together with an ex-Rocket colleague to found a company which is Pandata that has been three years ago now and we're almost 20 <coughs> people now. And what we do, I'll, I'll tell in a bit because that's obviously closely related uh, to, my, uh, to my presentation. And yeah, so uh, yeah, as I said, we're uh, 20 people and uh, most of us are actually, uh, or all of us are actually working operationally in the field of data. So basically everyone at Pandata um, knows at least one programming language. And also, uh, we opened an art gallery recently that doesn't have to do much uh, with uh, the presentation, but I wanted to mention it anyway. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, every Tuesday we're, uh, we're open now at 6 and we have a really cool exhibition at the moment uh, of uh, tape artists. Um, and yeah, but uh, back to the topic, um, what are we doing with Pandata? It goes mostly along uh, these lines, what I refer to as the data value chain. And that starts uh, somewhere with web uh, and mobile tracking. This is a part that I will uh, talk a lot about uh, today as well. This is how we actually get uh, data from users. So this is the whole part of data gathering, meaning tapping into different data sources, but also uh, getting the data ourselves from users and uh, interesting things that happen on our products. Um, then we have the part of data aggregation where we think about how do we get all of these data together um, to actually uh, prepare it and, and get it ready for, for interesting analysis. And uh, this feeds into uh, the next part, the data processing, um, where we work with the data in order to prepare it for, uh, for the actual analysis. And then the last part, um, putting this data to use. Uh, this can be either for human consumption in uh, the form of reports or, or dashboards, but also in the shape of uh, feeding, feeding algorithms and, and other machines that then work with the data. So um, this will be roughly uh, also the guiding stick for, uh, for, my, for my short talk. Um, I'll start with the left part and then uh, move gradually uh, towards the right. And I want to start with this. Um, this is actually what happens when you set up a computer in between the internet and uh, the cell phone and open the app of one of our clients. I'm not going uh, to, to tell who it is, um, but on the other hand, that's something that you, can, uh, uh, that you can easily read yourself. So there's nothing secret in there. Everybody can do that and, and find that out themselves. But the reason I'm showing this to you is this is actually an app that shows the weather. And you would think um, not of a lot of data exchange would actually have to happen in order to just uh, show the weather. But all of that is marked orange here. Uh, has to do in some way with either advertising or user tracking. And this happens only when you open the app. And I find that always, uh, on one hand, a bit shocking, but also interesting um, what our phones and, and websites that we open do um, where, without even us noticing. And I mean, you can think of that what you, what you want. For us, this is very interesting because obviously um, many of our projects uh, are, are based on these things. Um, but also you might want to consider that for your uh, companies or for your products to uh, make sure that you're capturing these data. Um, how do you get there? And I like to refer to a picture uh, similar to this um, that shows off a bit of the basic architecture um, we usually build our setups around. And 
you could imagine this from uh, the single user going over to uh, the larger scope, the website, the product itself. Obviously, this could also be an app. Um, in the talk, I will mostly refer to websites um, because uh, that's a bit simpler uh, than, than it works on apps, actually, due to different technologies that you have to uh, employ when, when building an app. Um, there's a bit of a different beast when it comes to, uh, to user tracking. Um, every once in a while I will drop in some, some hints on, on where the differences are, but actually uh, app tracking and user tracking on apps is a bit more, uh, more complicated and very often we see that um, especially, especially marketing people who are familiar with uh, how user tracking on, on the websites work believe that they could just one-to-one -one, uh, use everything on, on an app. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So uh, if you ever hire a marketing person or uh, someone to set up uh, user tracking or data for your app, uh, make sure that this person actually knows uh, what they're talking about. Um, yeah, and then on the, the third level, uh, we have kind of the organization, um, which is obviously the, the overarching unit where we have to make sure that the data that we're generating about, uh, about the users and from our products are actually being used and are actually uh, put into the right places. And one thing that uh, I always like to refer to here is this single point of uh, truth um, where you would in the best case have all of your data in one version that everybody agrees on. Um, be assured that uh, basically never happens in any company, uh, but uh, in the optimum case uh, you would have that. Uh, I'll start with the user now and uh, I'll tell a bit about the things that we, that we get from a user. So on one hand, um, as said, it's a bit specific to the websites. Uh, on, on mobile apps, this works. Uh, this can work a bit differently. Also, the tools that you have to use there are different. Um, dropping in one hint here is um, when you work with an app, always think of what the app is supposed to do. Uh, one big differentiation here is whether the app should be a customer retention tool mostly, so to basically facilitate uh, the, the customers working with you as a company. Or, um, or if it should actually acquire users as well. For an app, this makes a, a, a large difference. And from what we see, many apps uh, are also only for, uh, for, for customer retention purposes, which has actually quite big impl uh, implications on, on what tracking software you would choose. And also, on web, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty much uh, dominated by Google, there are a few other, uh, other players on the market, but uh, most, of the, most of the user tracking on, on web is, is done with the Google tag stack, while on mobile um, this, looks, uh, this looks much different. On mobile you still have a lot of different providers and you might also have to choose a combination of different tools. Um, back to uh, closing that large bracket here, um, back to our user and the information that we get about him or her. Um, one thing that we, definitely need, uh, def that we definitely know about the user is the URL he or she visited us with. And interestingly, this already contains very often some information. And this helps us to figure out um, where the user came from. Did he or she come from an app, or uh, sorry, from an ad, or, uh, or through a Google search, and so on. And this is already a piece of information that we can use. Uh, additionally, we have cookies, or uh, for uh, the techies among you, uh, there is also the, the web storage, which is uh, basically cookie 2.0. And this allows us to flag a user and to recognize a user again when he or she comes back. So this is also a place where we can store information about that user for later use. Um, and we have the browser data, which is also interesting, um, where we get information about uh, what are the language settings of that user, what browser is he or she using. And actually there's a really neat trick uh, that you can do in order to identify users. Um, you can take all of this information and generate a so-called fingerprint out of them. And this is a way uh, of recognizing a users, again, that might have uh, some defense against, uh, against tracking installed. Um, Definitely uh, rather rarely employed, but also uh, quite an interesting way of identifying users again. So this is basically the information that we get about a user that we can capture. 
Um, it's not a lot. I mean, it does look like a lot, but it's, it's actually not that much. But uh, together with the next part, which what happens on the, on the website, on the product, this is quite interesting. And uh, there are a few key terms that I would like you uh, that I would like you to remember here. Uh, if you ever uh, have to, if you ever have to set up some tracking on your website and think about how to actually cap uh, capture user data, then there are these few keywords that you uh, that you should be familiar with, in my opinion. Um, I'll start in the middle. Um, one is the tag management system, and I put here as an example the Google product, but there are definitely others as well. As said, on the web, uh, on the web, uh, Google is very dominant, so uh, most of the setups uh, will probably use the Google Tag Manager. And uh, this is a tool that uh, that basically controls all your tracking. So this is the. Uh, basically the command center where you put in uh, what kind of uh, stuff you would like to capture about the user. So where do they click and so on and how do you actually get that into place. This is what this tool does and it controls basically everything that, uh, that happens in the, in the tracking tools above. And I could explain a bit more in detail what it technically does but I would skip that part and maybe we can put that into the questions later. Um, on top of that, you would set up your tracking tools and also um, you would often want um, all the marketers will thank you if you put in these so-called marketing tags and pixels. And if you, uh, if you ever have to set that up, think of the tag manager here and think of that you can set that up even yourself, even with none or very little coding within this tool called tag manager. And then there is the so-called data layer, which is basically an interface from the website to the tag manager. This is where the website has an interface to uh, send data into the tag manager that then can be further used into the tracking. So it's basically when the website wants to tell, hey, look, somebody clicked that button, then it would, this would go via this so-called data layer. Um, I know this might sound a bit complicated now, and it's definitely a very short, uh, introduction on that. The key here is, I think, please remember these terms because if you ever, uh, if you ever have to speak about that, you will definitely, uh, you will definitely face these again. And then uh, the point that I spoke about before already. Um, in the end, we want to funnel these data all into one uh, single point of truth that we can then use for further analysis and um, where we can also uh, combine it with other sources of data. This I will also talk a bit more about uh, in a bit. What data are we capturing from a website? And it's definitely the most beautiful slide of all. Um, typically, what you would get from a website is the acquisition data. That is, where does the user come from? This is the story with the link that I told before. We would capture something that we refer to as events. These are the actions that actually happen on the website. So for example, a user clicked somewhere, or a user scrolled a specific length uh, to a specific depth on the page, or the user stayed a specific amount on the page. And usually you could always think in terms of, uh, in terms of these events. Um, there are also page views, these are not in there. Um, this is basically whenever the user opens a specific page. And uh, there is conversions, which is basically just a, a different flavor of events where we just say this event is so important to us um, that we want to mark it as a conversion. Usually there are two types of them. One is called micro, one is called macro. So the micro conversions are the small ones basically. So imagine somebody signs up to a newsletter on your page. That's definitely a very important event because that shows a very clear interest in, in your product. So this is what you would consider a micro conversion. Or um, somebody generates a user account. That would be typically also a micro but the one goal that uh, you want to direct the user on, and this is important that you have um, on your website one specific goal you want to direct the user to. In e-commerce cases, obviously this is usually buying the product, but uh, depending on what your business is, this can be a lot of different things. Um, this is what we would then refer to as the macro conversion. And you see, in the end, these are all just events, but uh, these are spe special events that we want to highlight. This is why we refer to them as conversions. And usually what you would get from your, uh, from your web tracking tool then often is something like this funnel chart that you see here, where you can follow users across the different stages of that process, and in the end uh, stands the micro conversion. Um, that uh, you want the user to do, and on each stage usually people drop. 
And in basically most of the cases um, where you have this clear end goal uh, that you want to direct the user to, you can generate a report uh, similar to this one where you look at uh, the different stages and the users that you actually lose across these stages. This is a very healthy looking funnel um, because you see there is no major drop on, on one of the steps but what often happens is that you might see a large drop uh, somewhere and then you might want to investigate in that point and, and see why this is actually the case. But um, you might see, wow, that's even more beautiful. Um, you see that uh, this data is pretty flat. I mean, all of these events and, uh, and conversions, this is quite flat because it's just um, counting things or, or getting some information that somebody clicked the button and so on. Um, but where you actually need to get to is translating this into business objectives. And this can sometimes be really tricky to associate actions that happen somewhere to a user to some specific uh, business object or um, maybe in a step before that some kind of hypothesis that you uh, that you might have and uh, usually what what we do very often in our projects is this translation work and uh, this goes both ways this goes top down and, and bottom up and Often in the, uh, in the phase where you, you generate a setup, where you put all the tools in place, um, you might uh, choose the top-down approach where you first think about, okay, what is it actually that I, that I want to reach? And uh, on the basis of this, you would get to some idea of what, what tracking, what tools, what, what actions you want to measure, what events you would, you would like to have. Or often um, it might go the other way around, um, that you start, for example, like I, I put it here in the middle, um, by creating segments of users that have, um, that have specific characteristics or that you might look at specific user journeys from different uh, users that might have touched uh, upon different marketing channels or uh, users that, uh, that looked at specific pages in a sequence. Um, and you might then translate that into hypotheses and uh, business obje objectives you can validate against. Um, but what the point that I want to make is the data that you're getting is a bit flat and I think you have to go that step beyond in order to, to really put it into use instead of just plainly looking at the metrics and saying, oh, but my bounce rate uh, is, is, uh, has dropped 20% and uh, it's, it's very arbitrary if you only look at the plain numbers without thinking of, uh, of what stands beyond that. Good. Um, now I'm making a small jump into uh, focusing more on the users and a bit on the, the combining qualitative and quantitative uh, data. And I think uh, this is a very interesting way of getting insight on how, uh, how users use your product. Um, and there has been a lot of uh, progress uh, recently in, in those tools. Uh, since uh, I think about two years or so, Google Analytics has these, this nice view that still uh, many people don't know, I believe, um, which is a log of all the actions that one particular user did. And this is quite interesting. I know you probably don't want to look at single users, but what you can do is you can filter out a specific group of users that might have shown uh, uh, similar behavior and then look at these users qualitatively and just look at one user in particular. And obviously, you're probably not going to look at more than, than 10 users at a time, but this can give you a good feel of what's going on. And we use that actually a lot for, uh, for debugging purposes, for example, um, and also for, for understanding specific behaviors that we cannot really explain. And I want to show you today how to take that a step further, because that's obviously the standard feature. Um, but there's also a bit more that you can do. And uh, there are tools like this one on the right. Uh, that one's called Yandex Metrica and it's actually for free. So you can use, this, uh, you can use the tool for free. It's the <coughs> Yandex is the Russian Google. Um, and uh, probably that's uh, where you might want to consider what for free means. Um, but uh, at least it's nice to try and there are other tools. Uh, Mouseflow, for example, is one that you can actually use uh, within the GDPR boundaries. But aside from producing nice heat maps of uh, a website, this tool uh, can do something really cool, um, which is referred to as session replay. And that actually means that you can look at what the user did 
by seeing the movements of the mouse and the clicks on the page. I usually show a live demo, but uh, I don't have that today. Um, so uh, this image must suffice. Um, but this is basically what it looks like. So you can actually see your page and you see the, the cursor moving and you see the user clicking. And this is super creepy, uh, but it's also really cool because uh, you can detect UX problems very easily with that. Um, and if you combine these two, and this is the reason why I'm, why I'm showing them next to, another, to one another, because you have a user ID here and you have a user ID there, and it's possible to send these across so then you know which user uh, is which user there. So it's possible to quantitatively filter a group of users that you then look at qualitatively in a video. And if you think of that in the global context of um, you know, you, you have your systems connected together, uh, think of maybe you also have a CRM somewhere connected in the back, and you know the whole story of what was going on with that user in the process, and you can look at uh, the screen recording uh, of how the user interacted with the product. That's quite powerful, I would say. So that's that. Um, now the other jump uh, one step uh, further in, the, in this whole data value chain uh, to this single point of truth. And that's obviously a very abstract uh, schematic here, but the general idea is that you would have one database. Um, we usually use uh, relational databases here. Often Postgres uh, is a very good choice because it has a lot of features uh, that are good for data analysis and uh, it's also a very, very proven database. Um, we don't use uh, NoSQL or any of these fancy databases uh, usually because uh, often they make things more difficult where it's not even necessary. But I leave that up to, uh, to your uh, judgment. And this part here is uh, what we usually refer to as ETL. So this is getting in the data into the database. And uh, we would usually have small scripts that would then help us uh, tap into the different tools and get the data out. Uh, there are a few ways of doing that. We do that very often with Python, but uh, there are obviously also, uh, also different ways. So the idea is that, for example, we would connect to Google Analytics, then we would uh, connect to maybe your CRM tool, and so on, and get all of these data together so that we have it in one place where we can actually run the analysis on. And from there, once we have all the data in there and have structured it in a, in a, in a specific way, and that's a very important point too, um, there are many tools that promise you that they can do this out of the box. Um, famous one is uh, Tableau that you might be familiar with. These can all connect directly into these tools. We still advocate for having uh, the server in the middle because uh, even if you're using Tableau that can connect to all of these tools, in here, you can set up all the definitions that you need so that when you speak about one conversion or about one specific thing that a user uh, might have done, it's the same across uh, all of the reportings that you have. And this is very hard to control if all of this is happening in a tool like Tableau and not in one central place where you're not only storing the data but also its abstractions <coughs> where you're actually combining these data together so that you have one notion of what is a user or what is a, what is a purchase and so on. And this is a very common problem. Um, one, uh, uh, one example uh, to illustrate that maybe a bit better is for Google Analytics and for most of the tracking tools, a user is a browser. And they refer to this as users, but it's actually just a browser. And if you delete the cookie or change the browser, it's even a new user. Um, obviously, on your CRM, this is not a user. It's on your CRM, a user might be an email or a phone number or a combination of the two. So now you want to some kind of join these together in a way, in, in the best case, uh, so that you have one notion of what a user is. And this goes for basically everything in, in, in your business. And this is the logic that we want to bind in there. And once we've done that, um, we feed these into um, visualizations and other use cases, like other tools and so on. And the other good thing about that is the, vi the, the choice of the visualization tool 
um, doesn't have that much impact anymore. Because if you have done a good job in there, uh, the visualization you choose uh, is not that important because you can actually switch it if needed. Because if you have done all your pre-processing in there, um, you have a, almost a ready report uh, in the best case that you can just plug into uh, another visualization tool if you like. Good. Um, so much to that. Um, I will probably skip quickly about that one because I guess most of you are familiar with what an API is. Um, it stands for uh, Application Programming <coughs> Interface and it's a very easy way of accessing additional data but also accessing different tools. So basically any tool, Google Analytics, any other tool might uh, usually has an API that you can use in order to get data out of. But there is also a host of other APIs, services that you can access m in a machine readable way to get additional data out and merge that with your data. So now we're talking not only about using your own company data, but you can also uh, add in additional data. For example, you could tap into the Facebook API or the Twitter API um, to get uh, information about sentiment and, and things that might be going on on your Facebook page. And you might be able to combine these with the data that you have uh, already captured. Obviously, you will not always be able to combine these on a user level, so you won't be able to tell, okay, this user posted that on Facebook and then he uh, did this on our website, but um, you get the gist, right? Um, so that's that, and uh, I want to show you one example of, uh, of a really cool API that I like. Um, it's called Full Contact, and it basically searches the internet uh, for things that uh, you have put somewhere on social media or on any other places, and uh, it usually attaches these either to a phone number or an email address. This is my private email address, this is why I didn't put it in there. Um, and uh, these are the results that I get. And you see it even, I mean, if you follow that link, that's a picture of myself. Uh, it tells me what job I have uh, and so on. So it merges all of the information that uh, it can attribute to my email address. And this is obviously very interesting because uh, what you could do now is if you have a user's email address, you could, uh, you could use that API in order to enrich the information that you already have about the user with anything that is available on the internet. That's a paid service. Um, there are a few others of them uh, and many CRM tools, for example, uh, use such a service in order to enrich user information. But it's quite interesting. Um, it's a quite interesting example to show how you can use an API in order to enrich your data with an external source. Um, you might not be familiar with that format. That looks a bit confusing at the first glance. But this is actually easily machine uh, readable. It's called JSON, and it's an absolute standard format uh, for handling data. Um, so if you know a bit of Python, uh, it shouldn't be a big deal to work with that. Uh, one example that I had done like many years ago, uh, you see all the logs here, the entries are from 2016, um, was that I put this together um, with a small mock shop website that I had and combined the data with the user tracking data. And what you see here is uh, I even got the pictures of the people that visited uh, my website on that day and I uh, could get their job information. Um, but I could also get uh, the times uh, when they visited my website as well as from what channels the, uh, these people came from. And I mean obviously it's a bit of a silly example. You would not do that, uh, you would probably not do that in a real use case. Um, but it, just, uh, it sh uh, just should show what is possible uh, if you combine these different, these different data sources. Good, um, I'm actually uh, slowly coming to an end. Uh, one thing that I really like to talk about is, um, as you probably already wonder, where's the machine learning, where's the AI? Um, I like to talk about the iceberg in that regard. Um, all that I've talked about now is mostly in the bottom part of the iceberg. Um, that's the one um, the consumer of the data usually doesn't see, but that's the one that consumes a lot of time. Um, it's cleaning all the data, making sure that the data capturing properly works, and all of these things. Um, and only on top of that sits the reports and the dashboards uh, that 
the end user actually sees, as well as um, fancy machine learning applications and data science applications, important as they are, but don't forget that there is a lot of work to do uh, in the basement first, doing the actual plumbing of uh, connecting the different sources and making sure that everything works um, before I believe you should think about uh, the stuff that comes above. And one uh, actual case uh, that, we have, uh, that we have done together uh, with uh, the German public broadcasters uh, ARD and ZDF was this. Um, and this uh, I'm showing because it's a good example of the tip of the iceberg. This is a four meter wide monitor wall that you can now uh, actually see in, in Mainz in those towers of, of uh, ZDF. And uh, it shows sentiment data from their Facebook channels and so on. Um, they have a really cool project called Funk uh, where they're approaching a, a younger, uh, the younger generation via a lot of different media channels and we help them uh, analyze the data and um, make sure that they understand how uh, users uh, proceed from one, from one platform to another as well as um, how, uh, how, the sentiment, uh, uh, how the sentiment currently is uh, towards <coughs> one or the other video. And uh, this we have all displayed on, on this massive wall, um, but what gets easily forgotten when you see that thing is the work that stands behind, which is uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of plumbing and a lot of uh, connecting data sources and making sure uh, the data warehouse in the background works properly. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I had one question regarding the uh, full contact API. Um, how is it, uh, like, the general concern, especially in Germany, but Europe, uh, is about the GDPR? Uh, <laughs> so I was so much waiting for that question. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I mean, um, the good thing for us is that we, um, we usually work with uh, large enterprise clients, and they have legal departments, so um, we usually don't have to worry about that part, luckily. And, um, that's also why I'm not the most knowledgeable person in that regard. Um, still, this is all information that you at some point voluntarily gave to the internet. Um, it's information that is publicly available. Um, I don't really see how it could be forbidden that uh, somebody crawls the internet and just aggregates that information and makes it available in a, in a different place. Obviously, you still have to adhere to the general rules if I request from you to delete my data. Uh, then you have to do it consistently across all of the systems. <coughs> but in my opinion, and take that with a grain of salt, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know much stuff about that, um, it should be possible to, to use that within the, within the legal boundaries of GDPR. Thank you. Hi. So I would like to make a remark on that one. Actually, what you're saying is like technically true, but still the person needs to know they need to give you your consent, and if they don't know that you're handling their data in such a way, how could they res uh, request the delet deletion of the data? So I see a big concern with this uh, API, also from a legal perspective, because that is my background. So, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauties of uh, GDPR, right? <laughs> <coughs> um, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is a bit more like technical because I also work with data. And I have actually like two questions which are related. Uh, one is like when you manage the APIs, you basically have like on your coding something that you just like get, send get requests and then post it out in one database in like a central database so you can have like full control of it. And if you do this, like how you can actually relate, I mean like you can have like very different information, and to have like this one-to-many or many-to-many -many relationships can be very tricky. And the other one is like, how important do you think it is like the coding? Because um, even like for growth hacking, I see that people are talking about tooling instead of coding. So you have like Zapier, all these like tools that basically, even Google Tag Manager, Google Tag Manager could, could actually just like write a JavaScript with event listening, but we have a tool to do this today. So how, how do you see that is important of the actual coding and against tooling? And yeah, and the other one is the database. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, both very good and very valid questions. Um, yeah, regarding the database, um, so what we, I mean, obviously it all, in the end it comes down to get and post requests um, that need to be concerted and managed in a way. There are tools in order to do this. Um, the ones that we use mostly is on one hand called Jenkins. Um, some of you who had touch with uh, software development might know that mostly as a tool to concert build processes. Um, but it's actually a very good tool in order to um, uh, to concert all of the, the ETL processes. The other one is uh, a development from Airbnb called Airflow, um, which is uh, specifically for, for handling ETL processes. Both of these tools um, allow you to manage the, the scripts that get the data out from you. So uh, they, they do the scheduling and uh, they do a bit of error handling here and there, um, but not more. So what you're still left with is dealing with the data that flows in, in obviously, as you say, um, very different structures. And that's, that's basically the art of what we're doing, is making sense out of these. The approach that we usually choose is one of several layers where we just basically in the first place dump all of the data into the database and just take it as it is basically and then use um, the, the functions from mostly it's Postgres that we work with in order to clean the data and uh, bring it to a state that we can further work with. Usually we then process the data to a next layer um, where we have then cleaned and, and normalized data and then uh, to a next layer where we try to put it into um, what we would refer to as business objects, like for example, users, marketing costs and so on. And uh, so the table structure gets more and more narrow upwards. But obviously that's, that's a big challenge and uh, that's definitely where the, the art lies in, in, in what we're doing. Um, Good. Second, uh, uh, second question. Maybe if you could just repeat. Uh, and it's regarding about the, uh, the importance coding. of coding, right? Yeah, coding. Um, good. Importance of coding. I think it is still important, but obviously, as you say, uh, there are more and more tools in order to 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 do some tasks. Also on ET on the ETL side, uh, there are several tools uh, that can help you uh, connect to different APIs uh, and so on. Um, usually we choose an approach where we combine specific tools with parts that we code ourselves. Um, one example would be that solution using Airflow, but also some scripts that we write ourselves in order to, uh, to, to access uh, the APIs. Uh, also the Tag Manager is a tool that uh, can only get you rid of some coding, but still if you want to use it to its fullest extent, you have to be pretty good at JavaScript and know how a website works. And I think what these tools make easier is taking the first barriers um, by allowing you to, to set up a few things very quickly, but if you want to go beyond that and make sure that everything works well together, I don't think you, you get around uh, coding that easily. So I think the importance is definitely there. Um, also, I expect to see more and more tools uh, popping up. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you very much.